I'm Emma Louise Coffey and you're welcome to The Dairy Edge, the Chagas Dairy Podcast. We're bringing you the latest information, insights and opinion to improve dairy farm performance. On this week's show, Ander van Barnbelt from Gray's Consultancy draws on his experience of drought from 20 years of dairy farming in New Zealand and lessons Irish farmers can learn from the summer of 2018. In New Zealand, we almost expect to get dry uh, in one region or another. It gets dry almost every year somewhere, you know. So um, people probably farm for a drought in New Zealand much more so. And even if you're, you're classed as a summer safe area in New Zealand, you, you, you'll experience probably a, a dry summer, you know, one in three at least. So I guess that's the big difference is the, the mindset and the, and the people over there. Um yeah, over here people just don't don't farm for the dry and probably have never experienced a dry period like they have this year. And they? see, in terms of the droughts in New Zealand, how long would they typically last? Well, I remember one year I was working on a farm. We we started irrigating in September and we finished in April, so they can go on for a very long time. Um, you know, there'd be a lot of times where they'd start a little bit later and they finish very late. So I remember one year the drought broke on the 10th of May, which is equivalent to the 10th of November over here. So, you know, it was just incredible how long the dry period went on. So I remember the farm that I was on, we got down to a, a, a um, average farm cover of below 1500, which is, you know, what we'd class below zero. Um, and yet by the 1st of June, our farm cover got up to 2300. So like a farm cover of 800. So in three weeks, we went from from almost looking like the road um, to, to a farm cover of 800 kilos of dry matter a hectare average, you know. So we really, it's, it's the one thing you tend to get is, is you do get huge compensationary growth after a dry period. It always happened in New Zealand where if it went dry for a long time, you'd get growth at some some point. And that's that's the greatest difference in New Zealand is that people are not really concerned so much about what happens for winter feed. Um, generally, the cows either, either stay on farm grazing or mostly will go off to another block grazing and you'll always get enough time to grow enough grass there to winter the cows on and that's the big difference over here is is you know we're running out of time very very quickly to get enough forage for the winter on hand and that's that's for me the the greatest difference between the two and countries. And I guess I with the droughts then, you know, you're saying regionally they can be quite variable and people aim for the, you know, there will be a drought one in every three years. But in terms of the severity of droughts, are they increasing on farms? Like, are you seeing a, a bigger effect of drought on farms in New Zealand, say, opposed, as opposed to, say, 20 years ago? No, I don't think so. I think, um, you know, I found mainly through from the mid 80s to the mid 2000s, I suppose, myself. And, and through that time, like I said, sometimes we had droughts where where the whole farm would be like like you, you'd you see the road, you know, like if you drive through the paddocks, it'd just be a cloud of dust. Um, I don't think that's changed very much. It's just that um, maybe the frequency of the droughts is increasing somewhat. The, the biggest problem is New, in New Zealand is if you get a, a nationwide drought, then it's really, really bad. Generally, New Zealand has such a huge variation of, you know, it's such, a, such a long country um, going from quite close to the equator to a long way away from the equator that somewhere there'll be a lot of feed and they can transport feed from one area to another. Um, I don't think that's changed very much really in New Zealand, um, the severity of droughts or the length that they go on. Um, you know, some of the worst droughts that I know probably happened in the in the early 90s, I suppose. And, and you know, the one that finished on the 10th of May was actually about 2004, I think. And in terms of, um, you say people plan for drought and, you know, in a lot of New Zealand, um, farmers will have irrigation systems so they can negate the effects of drought. But what other steps do the farmers in New Zealand take to reduce the impact of drought? You see, I, I never farmed on a myself on, on an irrigated farm before, so I, I farmed on what was classed as summer safe land, but you'd still get summer dry. So we generally grew crops of turnips, um, and you know we always planned for for some kind of a dry period, so we grew turnips. But of course, the problem with them was generally that you'd have a fantastic crop when you didn't need them, uh, when you had a good year, and when you had a poor year, that the crop wasn't as good. But um, in the lower North Island where I was farming, we had we had uh, like 
competitions to grow the best crops of turnips and all those sorts of things. So, you know, it was very, very common to grow um, summer crops. So we tried to grow a, a, a low dry matter, high protein type crop to negate the the effect of, you know, very dry grass out there. But, you know, when I was farming, that was, I farmed before the time of palm kernel as well. And so basically we just, we just buckle down and ride our way through a drought. The first thing you do is you just get rid of all the passengers. You get rid of all your coals and you, and you bring your demand down as low as you possibly could on farm. And that was that was rule number one is to, is to, is to um, bring demand down and then go through the dry period and hope that it would rain. But generally you'd, you'd buckle down and expect it to be dry for, you know, two or three months really. Um, probably very much like we had this year over here, you know, a real – real dry period with a with a really really big deficit but generally people would have a crop of turnips or something on hand that they would actually still be able to um, run the cows through um, in the old days we we wouldn't have fed the cows palm kernel we didn't have in parlor feeders there was no concentrate being fed to cows and and so generally the cows were pushed really really hard through that time and and you know it wouldn't be unusual to lose at least half a body condition score on the cows through the and drive see, period. in terms of you know lo- losing body condition and pushing the cows hard what a sort of effect that would that have on overall production for the year yeah well you know like it wouldn't be unusual for us to get down to like a kilo of milk solid as a cow through the through the dry period you know whereas most of my clients over here now are sitting between 1.7 and 2 kilos of milk solid because they've really kept feeding the cows through the dry period. So, you know, we'd really push the cows and even quite often um, use once a day milking as a, as a way of getting through the dry period and, and just minding the body condition score on cows to some degree, you know. But it's, um, I, I remember one year I was in January, I went on once a day with the cows. Um, I decided not to go back on twice a day when rain did come because I just wanted to you know, get the cows to gain some body condition score and in March the cows are back doing sort of 1.3, 1.35 kilos of milk solids a cow on once a day. Um, very, very different approach, you know, very much more using the cows, pushing the cows through the dry period. And and that's one thing that I'm a bit concerned about over here is that people, people have fed very, very strong through the dry period and the farms that I've been to in the last week or so that have had a bit of rain, there's quite a bit of trash still sitting around the paddocks, so they've stopped really minding pasture quality. They haven't gone out with a mower and done any any corrective management at all. And now there's probably like 5% of the paddock covered with trash that's now not growing grass, you know. So um, the cows have really not been pushed to eat, uh, to eat the paddocks out really well through the dry period. And ju- just to follow up, you know, you talk about compensatory growth in the paddock, say, you know, the there's a lot of grass production. In, in terms of where your cows went down to, say, a, a kilo of milk solids um, uh, during, um, say, production per day during the drought, did you see any compensatory, say, a recovery in milk production? Yeah, like those cows would get down to maybe a kilo of milk solids, but be back up to 1.3, 1.4, even on, on once a day, you know. So guys that went back on twice a day would have been doing 1.4, 1.5 kilos of milk solids a cow. And this is in a time where, you know, we would have peaked at 1.7, you know, like we went sort of like most of my clients over here would peak at two kilos plus milk solids a day now. But, um, you know, back back then uh, we we probably didn't, didn't peak anywhere near those sort of levels. So, when you look at the percentage of of peak, um, the cows recovered really, really well. And then, if we if we consider fertility, um, then under the the drought in Ireland occurred pretty much at the onset of pregnancy for a lot of cows in the country. Would you um, expect an impact on fertility and in calf rates on farms across Ireland? No, I actually think in calf rates will be better than they ever will be. I think. Um, some of our greater concerns are, are around having a lot of grass in a normal year, people getting onto very, very quick rotation with grass growth at 100 kilos of dry matter a hectare a day sort of thing and, and trying to manage that. Whereas, you know, like when, when it gets dry, I think the composition of the pasture is just, just a bit better and the cows are fed so much um, concentrate and all sorts of different products through that time that I think, I actually expect very, very good in calf rates. And in fact, some of the people that I've spoken to that have done some scanning, 
showing incredibly good results at the moment. So I'm not sure about entry rates. So the back end might have been affected, but certainly the six week in calf rates look look very, very good from what I've seen so far. Okay. Far. And then when we when we take cognizance of your experience in New Zealand and you know we we've we've looked at the the Irish situation in terms of cows are very well fed. Uh, farmers have really looked after their stock with say purchased feed. Um what is your opinion on how the Irish farming community coped with this drought? I think everybody coped very, very, very well. But the problem is, I suppose, paying for it. You know, like everybody, Irish farmers are fantastic at feeding cows. You know, they they, they love their cows and they're fantastic at feeding them. But they're not very good at paying their bills, probably, and tend to use the merchant as a bit of a bank. And so the concern would probably be the, the the amount of um, bills that have been stacked up now and, and how they're going to be paid for, really. And that's going to be something that's going to be much more of a residual effect for the Irish farm than what it would have been for the New Zealand farmers, you know. So, um, you know, production's held up well. The, the cost per cow per day in feed is probably set somewhere around the uh, three to four euros a day for a lot of people um, per cow. And, and uh yeah, that would be a bit of a concern of 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 what impact that's going to have on on financials. And then really. you know, in hindsight, and and you know, we again we can we can talk about the feed here, but like you know, when you talk to the farmers you're dealing with, um, what advice would you have in terms of what should be done differently if something like this occurs in the future to protect the farm business? I don't. I don't think our farm should should have too much of a knee-jerk reaction and from some some of the things i've seen on on social media some people are, are you know really freaking out and, and having a bit of a knee-jerk i, I don't think our farms should start farming like this uh, for, for these sort of years but the one thing they need to do is be be much more proactive when a period like this hits and you know even in a good year i feel so many farmers carry a huge number of passenger cows in the system, you know, cows that are very, very poor performing because, you know, the Irish farms have grown so rapidly since the abolition of quotas. Every cow is being kept and there's a lot of cows in herds that, that probably shouldn't be there. You know, like at the onset of a dry period like that, the first thing that needs to happen before you start putting the meal up to, to you know, higher levels, um, those cows should be gone because I always say effectively – when you start putting a meal up to, to to compensate for the lack of growth, effectively the worst cow in your herd is being fed a 100% diet of meal. And the question is, is that cow profitable at being fed a 100% diet of meal? And in most cases, there'll be you know, 2%, 5%, maybe even 10% of cows in the herd that shouldn't be there. So those those cows can have such a huge impact on the demand on farm and they should be gone. You know, So being more proactive around those sort of areas and and um, you know being being better at calculating feed requirements and uh, where the winter feed is going to come from, and not just looking at stocking rates as a as a what a farm can carry from mid April to mid September, but looking at it overall over a 12 month period and how those cows are going to be fed. You know, um, a lot of people I think are setting their stocking rates because they they yeah maybe out of um, uh, peer pressure and, and going to discussion groups, everybody sets a stocking rate at a certain level and they don't they don't really know what the farm is capable of growing and where the feed is going to come from for a 12-month period. And I suppose just to, to um, touch on the passenger cows, you mentioned, you know, poor production cows. What other type of cows would you have called, say, in the past um, when you experienced drought in New Zealand? Oh, repeat mastitis, repeat lame cows. Um, just, you know, I, I'd never seen a fat cow. <laughs> In 20 years farming, I'd never seen a fat cow because, you know, people always get to the point where if a cow's putting weight on the back, she's not efficiently putting putting dry matter into milk solids to go into production. So she shouldn't be there. So I'd actually never seen a fat cow for years. Um, but um, you know, problem cows, cows that, that cost money, they they shouldn't. And be if we weren't in a yeah. drought year, okay, and we were talking about these type of cows, um, say say you're a dairy farmer, um, you're milking a herd of hundred cows, and you have say five of five cows that fall into that category, so five percent of your herd, 
at what stage of the year would you consider getting rid of those cows? Would you do it, say, immediately after they calve or would you, say, hold on to them into the, say, into the lactation? Yeah, I'd be pretty ruthless myself, I suppose, and with my clients, I'd be pretty ruthless that those cows shouldn't exist in the herd. So, you know, they should be gone as you identify them and you're always better to replace them with good cows than to have them in the herd. But um, once you have them in your herd after calving, you've gone through the costly period of carrying them through into the spring. So once they calve and and they're going pretty well, well, then as long as you've got a feed surplus in the system but you know you can you can carry those cows but as soon as you get to a point where you run into a feed deficit or you know your pasture demand exceeds your pasture growth then those cows they they, they should be gone and i suppose finally then andrew um if we look at pasture base ireland figures um there is a lot of recovery occurring across the country and we're seeing some compensatory growth with you know growth rates of say 44 kilos in the last week in the south of ireland and up to 60 kilos in the north what advice have you for dairy farmers to get through from now until next spring if we consider there's a father shortage on farms you know, the big thing is to be to, to have the finger on the pulse and really do those calculations. You know, look at your stocking rates, um, get rid of passengers, carry, you know, only the cows that are going to be really productive next year through the winter so that you, you have a lower demand. There, there is no no place on farms to carry coals, I don't believe. You know, like a lot of people fattening coals, they just they, they just don't fit into a system. They have too great an impact on the demand on farm. Um, and just really look at pushing pushing pasture growth through this this time um, to make sure they take surpluses out efficiently so that they maximise the fodder on hand. And then even in situations like this, um, usually I would look to keep going in the back end. If we have a very good back end where the soil temperatures stay up very well, usually I'll try and get farms closing at around that sort of, you know, 650 maybe 700 kilos of dry matter hectare at 20th of November. Um, I would expect that with quite a few clients, we'll be dropping that down a little lower and may, may close as low as 500 kilos in the hope that the conversation and growth will continue through the winter and that will still open with a good cover in the spring, you know, but it's it's really trying to, trying to reduce the amount of winter fodder that's required by reducing the date the dry days and the, the house days as much as we can that's great thank you Ander no problem that's it for this week's episode of the Dairy Edge podcast and my thanks to Ander Van Barnveld for joining me on this week's show don't forget to subscribe on Apple and Google Podcasts and for more information go to the Chagas website at chagas.ie I'm Emma-Louise Coffey and join me next time for your Dairy Edge <laughs>